Flashman and the Angel of the Lord by George MacDonald Frazier. So this is the 10th book in the Flashman series. And now that we're 10 books in, I think we're past the point where we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the concept behind this series or the origin of this series. If you want some more information, I'll link to some of my other Flashman videos in the description down below. Or, uh, the short version is that this is a type of historical fiction. Uh, Flashman is a disrep fictional, disreputable soldier uh, in the Victorian era. Uh, and uh, the, the various books follow, follow him on various escapades around the 19th century. In this volume, Flashman joins John Brown and the raid on Harper's Ferry. Now, in my opinion, John Brown is one of the more fascinating characters in history. John Brown may have been slightly crazy. We'll, we'll get more into that in a minute. Uh, but he was also a, at least a figurehead for one of the great idealist movements in history. And so much of history is just depressing. It's just stories of greed and selfishness. So these stories of idealism, even though they're mixed with some other elements, are refreshing to hear, and I think they need to be told more. The problem is getting Flashman himself into the narrative. Since Flashman is first and foremost a self-preservationist, and since he despises all forms of altruism, joining John Brown's suicidal raid into Harper's Ferry is the last place you'd expect to find him. And it's a problem acknowledged very early on in the book. I'm quoting now from pages 20 and 21. This is Flashman talking. Uh, Flashman is the narrator of these books. He says, You will wonder, if you're familiar with my inglorious record, how I came to take part with John Brown at all. Old Flashman, the bully and poltroon, cad and turncoat, lecher and toady, bearing freedom's banner aloft in the noblest cause of all, the liberation of the enslaved and the downtrodden? As any of you who have read my other memoirs were have guessed, I'd not have been within 3,000 miles of Harper's Ferry or Blasted Brown, but for the ghastliest series of mischances. Three hellish coincidences. Three, mark you, not even Dickens, wouldn't have used for fear of being hooted at in the street. But they happened, and that damned nemesis logic that has haunted me all my life and landed me in more horrors than I can count. And then after contemplating for a couple more pages how strange his life has been, Flashman finally gets around to beginning the story on page 23. It began, it usually does, with a wanton nif with sorry, with a wanton nymph in Calcutta at the back end of 58. And thus the wheels of the story are set in motion. Now, because of all the convoluted plot needed to force force Flashman unwillingly into joining John Brown, 200 pages pass before Flashman and John Brown even meet. But the good news is that these 200 pages are not wasted. They're packed with the usual sort of fascinating historical detail that you've come to expect from these Flashman books. And a full 40 pages of footnote and appendixes further expanding on the historical events and personages that intrude into Flashman's story. Uh, a coworker of mine, who is also a Flashman fan, uh, once commented, commented to me that the detailed footnotes are the best part of a Flashman book, and I'm inclined to agree. Which brings me to the history. I had thought I had known the history of John Brown and Harper's Ferry, but after reading this book, I was continually surprised to realize just how much I hadn't known. George MacDonald Frazier has thoroughly researched the event to bring to life the little details surrounding Harper's Ferry that don't usually make it into the history books, or at least not the high school history books that I grew up with. 
Take, for instance, this description of one of the exchanges between John Brown's men and the hostile townspeople. Now, I've taken this out of context, so there's going to be some unfamiliar names and it's going to start right in the middle of the situation, but I, I'm, I'm hoping this will give you a feeling for the, the, the extra level of detail that goes on here, even though this is historical fiction, uh, showing you all the little intrigues or all the little events that get left out of a high school history textbook about what actually went on in Harper's Ferry. Okay, quoting from the book. And then John Brown sent out another white flag. There was a great howl of fury when it appeared in the armored gateway, but a militia officer bawled to them to hold their fire, for it was borne by one of the hostages who came marching towards the hotel with young Bill Thompson by his side. The crowd surged out and surrounded them, drowning the hostages pleas to be heard. The flag was torn from him, and Bill Thompson was dragged into the Wagner house, battered and kicked with yells of, Lynch the bastard! No, no, hanging's too good for him! Burn the son of a bitch! The drunken din from beneath was now so deafening that there wasn't a word to be made out. But since they didn't haul Thompson out for execution, I guessed he was still alive, for the time being. You'd have thought John Brown would have learned from that incident, but not he. Not long after, another white, white rag was seen waving in the armory. The order to cease fire was shouted again, and this time it was Aaron Stevens and Watson Brown who came out side by side. You bloody fools, thinks I. You're done for. But on they came towards the hotel. Watson, stiff as a ramrod, with his head carried high, and Big Aaron plowing along with one hand raised like an Indian in greeting. For a moment, it was so still I could hear their boots squelching through the puddles. And then a rifle cracked, and Watson stumbled forward and fell on his hands and knees. A great cheer went up. A volley of shots followed, and Stevens seemed to hesitate, and then he came for the Wager house like a bull at a gate, hurling the flag away, and was cut down within twenty paces of the hotel. I absolutely saw his body jerk as the slugs hit him, and then the hostage, who had been with Bill Thompson, came running out, arms spread wide, turning to put himself between the two shot men and the mob. Another hostage, who must have been following Stevens and Watson's from the armory, ran forward to join him, and together they dragged Stevens to the Wager house, one of them yelling, You cowardly scum! Stop it, damn you! Can't you see the flag? For a moment the firing stopped, and then it was seen that Watson was crawling on all fours back towards the armory, and the mob set up a great yell and yet fly again. He scrambled up and ran, clutching his stomach, with the bullets churning the dirt around his feet, and went down again, but he still kept crawling and managed to roll to cover behind one of the gateposts. That sent them wild, and they poured in fire harder than ever. So I thought that was really interesting. I, I mean, I, I thought the whole book was really interesting, but usually when you learn about Harper's Ferry in American history classes, you learn that, you know, John Brown did the raid on Harper's Ferry and then he surrendered to the militia. But, but you don't read about these little incidents about how John Brown's men are trying to surrender to the crowd. And, and the crowd is so incensed at what's happening that the crowd is refusing to accept their surrender, shooting at them when they come out with the white flag. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's these little historical details that just get left out of your high school history book that are just so fascinating when you get into them. And, and again, I know this is historical fiction. I don't know exactly how much dramatic license is taken with each scene, but I, I do know that George MacDonald Frazier has researched this thoroughly, and he's got 40 pages of end notes at the back to kind of back up everything he's saying. So I, I'm, I'm assuming that this is based on his research. I, I found it absolutely fascinating. In fact, I found it so fascinating 
that here is a list of some of the interesting things I learned from the book. Uh, for example, I really had no idea about the men who joined John Brown in his raid on Harper's Ferry. I mean, in, in history books, you just hear about John Brown. You never hear about the 21 other men who were on this raid with him. But there, there were 21 other men on the raid with him, and they all have stories. And George MacDonald Frazier has done the research, and he does a nice job of rescuing these 21 other men from historical obscurity and telling their stories. Now, again, it's historical fiction, but through this fiction, uh, we get decent pictures of people like John Kagi, who was uh, one of John Brown's men. He was actually Swiss. He was a young Swiss idealist who had gone over to join the fight against slavery, and he was John Brown's best strategist. Uh, and then there's another one called Shields Green, nicknamed Emperor. Uh, he was a freed slave, and he was one of Frederick Douglass's companions who ended up going over to John Brown's side after Frederick Douglass and John Brown met up. I also learned about the very bizarre role that George Washington's great-grandnephew played in the role of Harper's Ferry. Uh, and also the Sword of Lafayette, and also the, the Pistol of Frederick the Great. It's all part of the story. I, you'll have to read the book to find out more, but it, yeah, bizarre the way uh, it's interwined with John Brown's story. Another interesting note, in my high school history classes, I had learned that the raid, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry had failed because John Brown was counting on a slave uprising and that slave uprising never materialized. It turns out, at least according to George MacDonald Fraser's uh, version, that that's not the whole story. The, the reason it failed uh, is because the raid on Harper's Ferry was supposed to be a raid on Harper's Ferry, meaning they were just supposed to go in, raid it, get the get all the weapons, and then get out of there. And then they were going to use that weapons, those weapons, to form slave militias. But what happened is once they got to Harper's Ferry, even though the plan was to just raid it and get out of there, uh, in the heat of the moment, John Brown froze up uh, and wasn't able, for whatever reason, to, to issue the order to move on and ended up holding out on Harper's Ferry, even though that was not the plan at all. Uh, John Brown, by the way, is portrayed in this book as a very great charismatic leader, somebody who was very good at working up the crowds at the Northern abolitionist meetings, uh, but he was not a great military leader, is the impression you get in this book. Uh, speaking of which, I had no idea how much of a celebra celebrity John Brown was before Harper's Ferry. Uh, again, I, I, I mean, I had known something about bleeding Kansas and blah, 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 but, but I had gotten my impression from history classes that John Brown kind of entered into national prominence because of the raid on Harper's Ferry. Uh, from this book, I learned that he was already a national celebrity, and that's part of the reason Harper's Ferry was such a big deal when it happened, uh, is because he, he kind of brought his fame down with him. From this book, I also learned about the Secret Six, which is a cool name if there ever was one. That's, that's a group of uh, northern abolitionists who were funding much of John Brown's activities. Uh, and it, actually, it turns out that the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, uh, Julia Ward Howe, is one of the wife, uh, sorry, was the wife of one of the members of the Secret Six. So that's another interesting little historical footnote for you. Another thing I learned from this book, uh, after John Brown was wounded and captured at Harper's Ferry, uh, there's a bizarre scene in which he got into a long discussion with the public and with members of the press while laying wounded on his wounded cot that, that they were, had laid him down on. Uh, George MacDonald Frazier includes that in his novel, but he, he also backs it all up with the end notes at the end, um, indicating that this actually was a real historical incident. Okay, moving away from John Brown now and talking about the first 200 pages of this novel. Uh, as I mentioned before, the first 200 pages of this novel 
essentially function as a long prologue before Flashman even meets John Brown. But those pages are not wasted. Uh, George MacDonald Fraser, uh, it gives George MacDonald Fraser the luxury of going on several historical digressions. For those of us who love history, these various digressions, backed up by long end notes in the back, are a real treat. Uh, no doubt people who don't care for history would find it annoying, but then people who don't care for history probably aren't reading the Flashman books anyways. Uh, and of the many interesting things I learned from the first 200 pages, there's a throwaway comment that Flashman makes at the beginning of the book, uh, which leads to a page and a half endnote in the back of the book, telling the story of Jack Johnson, who was the first black man to win the heavyweight title. And then it turns out Arthur Conan Doyle is involved in the story and also Jack London. Now, according to this footnote, Jack London was so appalled by the idea of a black man beating a white man at boxing that he started a, I can't even quote it, a whip the inward campaign to remove the golden smile from Johnson's face. That's a rather unflattering detail about Jack London. Now, I had kind of, I had known before that Jack London had a mixed record on racial relations. Uh, I, it, this had popped up years ago when I was young and idealistic and, and enamored with leftist history. And I was reading through a list of famous socialists throughout the ages. And Jack London was on that list because he, he was a democratic socialist. And there's a little asterisk next to his name that said he was also a white supremacist. The implied meaning being, so take his legacy with a grain of salt. So I knew that, but I had assumed, you know, he was a white supremacist like everyone back then. A lot of people back then were kind of vaguely racist or, you know, maybe he had some ideas that were politically incorrect nowadays. I had no idea he was such a vehement white supremacist that he was going out of this way to make this whole whip the inward. It, it didn't actually say inward in the actual text. Uh, whip the inward campaign uh, because he was so incensed uh, that a black man had beaten a white man at boxing. Uh, so it it. It tarnishes his legacy somewhat. Uh, and uh, I have given Jack London a very good review on this channel before for his book, The Iron Heel. Uh, and I'm beginning to think maybe I should have tempered that review more. Although I separate the art from the artist. Uh, I don't know. Okay, moving on to the next notes. A another thing I learned from this book I also learned that William Seward, another character in this book, who in 1858 widely believed, sorry, William Seward was in 1858 widely believed to be the next president of the United States, but he lost the 18, 1860 Republican nomination to this relative unknown who came out of nowhere, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but before Abraham Lincoln came on the scene, everybody thought William Seward would be the next president. Uh, George MacDonald Frazier goes into all his biography in the end notes, and it's a fascinating little story. Another fascinating little story here is the story of Alan Pinkerton. Now, now, I just mentioned previously that in my youth, I had been interested in leftist history. If you're at all familiar with leftist history, you're probably familiar with the Pinkerton Detective Agency, uh, which was uh, during the Union days at the turn of the century. Uh, it, was, it was famous for being a, a group of thugs who would get hired out to kind of break strikes or beat up union workers. But it turns out that Alan Pinkerton himself, the founder of this detective agency, has an interesting history. Uh, he lived from 1819 to 1894, and he was a member of the Chartist movement in England. Uh, Chartist movement was a radical workers' rights group in England in the 1830s and 1840s. And after participating in Chartist protests in England, he was uh, in legal trouble. They were going to arrest him, so he had to move to America. So the whole reason he ended up in America in the first place because he was a 
a, a radical worker. So how ironic that his detective agency would, would later grow on to get the infamous reputation that it did, although I think most of that was after his death. Um, and he was also a friend and supporter of John Brown, which is how he gets into this book. Okay, back to John Brown again. Uh, there was an interesting meeting between John Brown and Frederick Douglass. And, uh, the, you know, you, this is one of those things you can imagine, two historical titans meeting up. Um, it's rather interesting, though, this is one of the few areas that George MacDonald Frazier doesn't have footnotes for. Uh, usually every historical event is kind of backed up by his end notes saying, I got this from this source, I got this from this source. Which I think is because, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's because we actually don't have any record of what jo uh, Frederick Douglass and John Brown said to each other, right? Well, like, we know they met, but nobody took records of the meeting. Um, but what, one of the other things I learned about Frederick Douglass, which I hadn't known, is that after Harper's Ferry, he had to flee from the United States. Uh, even though he had distanced himself from John Brown before that, just the political fallout from it uh, made the United States too uncomfortable for him, and he, and he had to leave it. Okay, uh, for the remainder of this review, I'm going to get into some nitpicks I have with some historical details in the novel. Uh, on page 103, Flashman is describing the problem of slavery in America, and he makes the, th the theory uh, that uh, if America had never left the British Empire, they wouldn't have had to deal with this slavery problem in the first place. And then he lays out his reasoning as follows. But what astonishes me today is that all the wise acres who discuss its origins and inevitability, uh, he's talking about the slavery question in the Civil War, Never give a thought to where it really began, back in 1776, with their idiotic Declaration of Independence. Oh, so, sorry, I, I should make clear, uh, if I haven't already, uh, Flashman is a British soldier, and the author of this book, George MacDonald Frazier, is British. If they'd, ha if they'd had the wits to stay in the empire then, instead of getting drunk on humbug about freedom and letting a pack of fireband, firebrands, who had a fine eye to their own advantage, drag them into a pointless rebellion. There would, never, there would never have been an American Civil War, and that's as sure as any if can be. How so? Well, Britain abolished the slave trade in 1807, and slavery in 1833, and the South would have been bound to go along with that grumbling, to be sure, but helpless against the will of Britain and her northern American colonies. It would all have happened quietly, no doubt with compensation, and there'd have been nothing for North and South to fight for. Q.E.D. Uh, end quote. My own opinion is that possibly, I, I, I mean, it's, it's an interesting hypothetical, but uh, let me pick a few holes in this theory. It is true, as he says, that Britain abolished slavery about 30 years before Americans did, in 1833. But, but there's a difference between slavery and the slave trade. I mean, the slave trade meaning kind of getting slaves from Africa and importing them into uh, America or into the British Empire. Uh, and then slavery within America or slavery within the British Empire. Now, although Britain abolished the institution of slavery 30 years before America, abolishing the slave trade, meaning kind of stopping the slave ships from going to Africa, that actually happened about the same time in both countries. And there's at least one book that I came across, uh, The Decline and Fall of the British Empire by Piers Brendan, that argues that Britain actually abolished the slave trade because they knew America was about to abolish it. Quoting from that book now, quoting from The Decline and Fall of the British Empire, quote, For various reasons, British parliamentarians believed abolishing the slave trade would no longer be economically damaging, particularly as America was also outlawing the slave trade and other countries were expected to follow suit. End quote. 
So if America had never left the British Empire, then the slave trade might not have been abolished, or maybe it would have been abolished much later than it actually was. And then perhaps Britain would not have abolished slavery in 1833. Also, part of the reason Britain was able to abolish slavery in 1833 was because they had cut the, the American South away from them, or the American South had cut itself away from Britain. So, it, I mean, if the American South and its dependent economy had still been part of the British Empire, would the British Empire have abolished slavery in 1833? I mean, Flash, Flashman seems to think that uh, they would have gone along with the British Empire, but would the British Empire have even made that step in the first place if it had been still tied to the, the economy of the American South? I, I actually don't know. Uh, I, 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 you could talk me into either position. Uh, I'm just, th these are little things that pop up in my head w when I read that section. Uh, li little nitpicks, if you will. I, I'm not saying I disagree with it completely, but I don't know if, I, if, if anyone can make a case for it either or. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. Uh, moving on next. Uh, Going to talk about the abolitionist and underground railway railroad workers, the underground railroad workers. Uh, they're not actually always portrayed positively in this book. I mean, obviously the cause that they're working for is positive, but quite often they come off looking as crackpots. Uh, for example, on page 198, Flashman observes that Franklin Sanborn, who's a real person, he was a member of the Secret Six, he says, he was one of your tip Tip-top babblers, I could see, smiling, fidgeting, and suddenly, suddenly remembering to offer us refreshment, with more prattle about the fatigue of traveling and the crowded of railway cars. If this is a sample of our abolitionist conspirators, I can see American slavery flourishing for a century or two yet, thinks I. I thought this was unnecessarily snide, and, and granted, Flashman's supposed to be a snide narrator, but, you know, I think sometimes I feel like the Northern abolitionists or the Underground Railway workers, railroad workers, just get a lot of snide comments from historians about, you know, how they didn't do this right or how they didn't do that right, and pe people don't give them enough credit for being on the right side of history. But that being said, uh, if Frazier is a bit harsh on the abolitionists, he also balances things out by being harsh on the other side, meaning the, the mob violence in the South. Uh, he shows the extreme hatred and mob violence from the slave owners of the South. Uh, the citizens of Virginia are so outraged by the abolitionists coming into their, their territory uh, that they shoot down John Brown's men even when they try to come out under a flag of truce. In fact, that was part of the extended quotation I read earlier. Uh, one of the men that they do capture under a flag of truce, Bill Thompson, they later lynch, even though he came out under a flag of truce, and then they use his dead body for target practice. So there is a lot of venomous hatred coming out from the slave owners here. Uh, the, 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 the southern, the, the, the southern s slavery supporters. Uh, and in that respect, I guess the abolitionists are coming off not half bad by comparison. Um, as to the question of John Brown's sanity, uh, Frazier take this, takes this question up, actually, in one of the appendixes of the end, at the end of the book. Uh, and after weighing sort of the evidence on both sides, he concludes with these words. The question of John Brown's sanity cannot be answered now. He was held fit to plead at his trial. Rightly so, for as far as we can tell, not many laymen would, on the evidence, call him normal or balanced. Reasoning insanity is the judgment of one eminent historian, and it will do as well as any other. We cannot know him, but it does not matter. He is part of history and historic legend, and if what he tried to do was not heroic, then the word has no meaning. Yeah, 
I'd agree with that. Uh, that by the way, that's from Appendix 1, page 354 in the back of the book. Okay, moving on to another topic. I, I want to raise the question